here like to travel? How many want to make an impact in this world? Okay. And how many feel life is going by so fast, too fast? Well, what brought it home to me was teaching international development students a few years ago. You know, they're the fearless kids who are going to save the world. They're in relief efforts. They're even in war zones. And it made me realize how sheltered my life was. Then, a close friend from high school died suddenly at 50 on the same day as my milestone birthday. Suddenly, midlife shifted from a milestone to the start of a deadline to go further, give back more, and open new doors. So I answered a call to volunteer at a socially responsible jewelry factory in Peru. They needed help telling Western tourists about their jewelry, but also about the poor, unskilled workers that they hire and give them free training to become skilled artisans with a chance at a better life. Now, as Michelle said, I'm an A-type personality, and I've never been to a developing country. I don't even speak a word of Spanish. Plus, I'm a hypochondriac who's never far from hand sanitizer and gravel. <laughs> but they need my help. Now, maybe you've heard of this too, but it, the factory was in Cusco, which is known as the center of the Inca Empire. And I heard that the Incas were in the healing. I wasn't broken. So I thought, I just wanted to travel and give back. Now, in retrospect, I think many of us have something that sort of eats away inside of you, don't we? Don't you? In my case, a couple of years earlier, a so-called friend had betrayed me, both professionally and personally. And it hurt. But I moved on. I was over it. As long as I didn't see or hear his name, yeah. I was fine. <laughs> or so I thought. So, I went off to Peru and lived with a family in Cusco that spoke next to no English. Fortunately, they spoke more English at the jewelry factory, which was in the top of a tall mansion with wrought iron guarded gates and home to seven big dogs. It was a family-run business led by Victor, who I soon learned was a shaman or Indian healer. Now Victor wanted me to spend my time there revising the workshop tour that they gave to tourists. I wanted to do more and over-deliver, but that's hard to do in a world that's on a completely different clock. Every morning he'd arrive at the factory and we'd hug and we'd say, when is Dales? When is Dales? Then the boss and others would drift off for breakfast, then they'd come back. And there's a short window before noon when they'd take off for a two-hour dinner. And when we all came back again, another round of hugs. When is Tardis? When is Tardis? I'm going to go home and start hugging people in the office and they're going to lock me up. <laughs> Some days, I worked late to try and catch up, but that meant leaving in the dark and stepping over the seven dogs sleeping at the bottom of the stairs. Somehow, though, after two weeks, tour was done and a website was well on the way. Victor looked like a pleased client ready to offer me a perk, <laughs> which he did. He invited me to participate in a healing ceremony that was scheduled to start at 9 o'clock that night. Now, I didn't need healing, but it was an honor to be invited. How could I say no? The ceremony started at the top of the factory in a tiled room, and in the middle, there was a fire and cactuses around it. Now, there was me and six big Russian men who apparently flew over for this ritual a couple of times a year. And then there was their translator, the shaman, and his assistant. So we sat in a circle while smoke from cocoa leaves and incense filled the air. 
And then he chanted in Quichua, which was then repeated in Spanish, then in Russian, and they threw in, threw in a little bit of English for the clueless gringo here. <laughs> then, one by one, we were called up and told to stand spread eagle while the assistant sort of brought this torch under your arms, through your legs, and around your aura. Well, they said your name and prayers. And after that, we were sent into a different room. Dimly lit lights and vibrant colored cushions and soft ritual music playing. Now, Victor told us to think of an upsetting experience or a sad time in our lives. I didn't have to think too long. <laughs> Then, he and his assistants started mixing this potion. And they were praying to Pachamama, or Mother Earth, and other Inca icons from the natural world. Then Victor drank the cup three times, each to heal something different. The first cup was to heal the body, the second for the mind, and the third for your spirit and soul. Then it was our turn. It was like taking communion in the Anglican church, but with really bad wine. <laughs> Fortunately, it was followed by a spoonful of honey, and then his assistant poured this flower-scented liqueur all over our hands and told me to inhale and cast away any negativity. Well, the Russians must have had a lot to heal, because they were going, <laughs> and then the assistant started handing out plastic bags in case we felt like we were going to vomit. Oh great, I thought, I just signed up for a physical purge and it's too late to take gravel. <laughs> Fortunately, it was just a precaution. So we lay back in the cushion. And we're supposed to focus on different parts of our body, giving thanks, and trying to get rid of any negativity. Now, I wanted to focus on my stomach. But it's Peru, and there's no central heating in Peru, so it's bloody cold. I thought, OK, this is midlife. Hot flashes, bring them on. <laughs> no such luck. So I wrapped up with a poncho and blankets. And slowly I got warm. I started to feel relaxed, even light. Then, an hour and a half later, the lights came up again, and the second cup went round. This time, we called on the power of the spirit to clean our mind and cast away any negative thoughts. And as I gracefully tried to drink this potion, Victor said, I think two cups may be enough for you. I thought that was a fine idea. So what I learned too later about this potion was it was made with the juice from the Wichima cactus, which has special healing properties. It's known to cure all kinds of illness, even cancer. So as we lay back, again, I felt a wave of calmness overcome me. And the incident that had plagued me for so long seemed almost minor. Again, the lights went up, and when the third cup went round, I stayed in the sidelines, hoping Victor didn't decide I really did need more healing. <laughs> then, we lay back, and we focused on healing our souls and connecting with the spiritual world. And then an hour and a half later again, the lights came up full, and it was all over. The next morning, I woke with a sense of calmness and peace. But I was also very tired and not very hungry. It was sort of like being hungover, but in a good way. And a week later, when I left, I have achieved a ton, even by Western standards. Victor and his family were thrilled, but for more than I expected. 
They called me kind, and they commented on my patience in working with the Andean tour guides and teaching them how to sell to tourists. And also what was overwhelming was their gratitude. They gave me a phenomenal feast and free jewelry. But stronger than that was a sense of warmth and goodness. Since coming back, I'm calmer and more at peace with the world. And the name that once made me so sad is now irrelevant. Now, maybe it was the healing ceremony, or maybe it was just living among the Andean people with their sense of warmth, their resilience and peacefulness that rubbed off. Either way, I learned the importance of reconnecting with the earth once in a while to heal your body, mind, and soul. And I felt the value of patience and slowing down. And I received a surplus of positive energy that I can draw on to deal with the stress of this world. Maybe someday I'll return to Peru, this time to promote healing ceremonies. Because everybody could do a healing ceremony, or so I think. <laughs>